All right. Well, good afternoon. Hi there. I'm Julie Kratz. I'm one of your hosts today. We will, um, I have with me Dr. Kristen Leach. She'll be talking with us as well. And she's waiting there on the screen. So we're both on video. Feel free to join on video if you feel comfortable doing so. Zero pressure either way. Um, but do plan to engage with us on the polling feature in the chat throughout the discussion. So the conversation today that we thank you for joining and participating in and leading the way as an inclusive leader is around bias training. And uh, we kind of made a bold statement here, and I know we had some uh, controversial comments <laughs> kind of online and feedback about bias training does work. And by no means are, are Kristen and I saying that it doesn't work at all. We're just going to offer some tools to supplement um, really intentional, consistent learning and disciplines around how to sustain the learning that's done in the classroom typically. So we're going to give you plenty of ideas on what to do instead. So I'm going to introduce myself, and then, like I said, Dr. Kristen Leach is with us today. She is going to introduce herself, and we'll get underway with some of the learning points we promised you and launch some of those polling exercises we talked about. Um, so if I have yet to meet you, my name is Julie Kratz. I'm an author, a speaker, and a coach on inclusive leadership. So I help organizations struggling with, just, you know, despite our best efforts, we're really focused on DNI, um, and we really believe in it, and our CEO's talking about it, and our C-suite's talking about it, but we're just not getting the results. Um, if that sounds familiar to you, that's <laughs> pretty common in corporate America, uh, and certainly around the world um, for organizations that really are focused on this, but not always seeing um, either the leadership reflect that, um, even middle management positions reflect that, promotions reflect that, meeting participation reflect that, all sorts of behaviors um, that I measure and write about. So I've written a few books. Uh, I started my coaching business and speaking business six years ago, Next Pivot Point, and it was really about my own corporate America journey. I spent 12 years in corporate America as a people leader, and I wish I would have had the tools to build my own career game plan or coach others to build theirs, um, how to be an ally, especially from a gender perspective. And now really pivoted into the overall diversity, equity, and inclusion space around allyship and what it means to be an inclusive leader. So you'll see a bit of that content today from my new book, Lead Like an Ally. Um, but most, most days before the COVID world was upon us, I was speaking on stages about women's leadership and equality for all. And that's my little one, Jane, pictured there in the slides. So she's really the essence for why I do what I do is to help promote equality. Um, when you think about gender equality here in the United States, we're 208 years away from that. Um, and we're actually seeing quite a backlash as of late um, with some really disturbing information about women perhaps exiting the workforce and being unemployed at much higher rates. And so the world is not equal. <laughs> and from a gender perspective, that is not fair. Um, so I really want to be a part of a positive message for her and for everybody across all genders to be supported in the work environment because it's really important that we're seen, heard, and feel a sense of belonging. So Kristen, if you want to introduce yourself to our guests as well. Thanks, Julie. Uh, really nice to meet all of you out there. Uh, some of you I know, a lot of you I don't. Um, I'm co-CEO CEO at Tidal Equality. We are a strategy firm at the intersection of social change and diversity and inclusion. Uh, I myself just have a history of being an activist, an academic community organizer. I work in strategy and education and consult organizations in Canada, the US, New Zealand, and in Europe as well. Uh, I was recently very lucky to be named one of uh, Forbes 10 Diversity and Inclusion Trailblazers to get uh, familiar with, and that's actually how I met Julie, was, was through that. Um, and my organization typically works with um, both private and public sector organizations to really find ways to create people-driven strategy and culture change. And that's kind of our bread and butter, but as we're gonna talk about a little bit today, our um, our organization has taken a pretty strong stance when it comes to the effectiveness of various interventions that are being and have been used in the workplace to uh, advance equity, diversity, and inclusion over the decades. And so I'm really excited to be bringing this chat to you today via Julie. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for being with us. And that's such a notable accomplishment. Kudos to you. Um, that's quite an honor to be included on a list like that. So I'm thankful for your allyship in this journey as well. Um, so today we're going to ask you some questions. Uh, so I promised you some polling exercises. I'm going to launch the first 
first one today. Uh, well, we kind of play back what we promised you. So what Chris and I have promised that you walk away with today is really an understanding of the why, why traditional unconscious bias training may not have worked in the past. And certainly I think a number of you mentioned you've had opportunities on that. Um, and perhaps seeing some mixed results. We'd love to hear from you on your perceptions around that and share, we'll share some of the work that we've seen inside organizations that have worked and maybe not worked so well. And the what, you know, what to look for in truly an effective diversity and inclusion training. Um, what we're starting to see in the future of work, and I'm doing some research around this and, and Kristen's also um, participating is really looking at what does this mean? Um, what does our current state and beyond mean for you know, diversity and inclusion? We're seeing this continue to be a top need as employees think about returning to um, that future of work workplace. Um, and, and now more than ever, there's been a spotlight on inequality. And so how can we use this as a real leverage point um, forward? So we'll, we'll help you understand um, how to design effective training programs. And then the how piece is how to ask the right questions to build what we call an intentional roadmap of activities that really help drive real systemic change. So at the root of, you know, any of um, racism, sexism, things preventing equality in the workplace from an overall diversity perspective. There's systemic issues um, that, that often have to be addressed and root causes to issues that we can't just simply put a uh, diversity training 101 wrapper around to solve these deep rooted problems. And then we're going to walk away some of the last five minutes for commitments. You know, with a plan in hand, we know your chances of success are much higher. And so we'd love for you to have some firm commitments, some things that you can take back um, to your workplace to have a positive impact and, and to really apply these tools. So it looks like the front Front runner on the poll, 80% voted. So that's great participation rate. So just a couple of people still left to vote. Um, but it looks like the winner here is get tools to apply at my organization at 54%. So a little over half of you want tools to apply. So Chris and I will make sure that we spend some time there. Uh, we've got some curiosity around the topic, about a third of you. And then the balance um, in second place is learn more about how to teach diversity and inclusion to others. So I know a number of you are practitioners yourselves or working inside organizations, having to build content, build initiatives, support roadmaps for change. So we want to give you some content content to also um, practice with your team. So that is all things that we promise that we will get to today. Um, so Chris and I first promised you the why. Um, why is this topic important? Why is bias training maybe falling a bit short? And I think first and foremost, if you haven't included this in your inclusion training, um, however you call it, you know, diversity and inclusion awareness training and conscious bias training, wherever you're starting the conversation, inclusive leadership training, wherever you're starting the conversation and educating people and growing awareness, I'm a big fan of always starting with what's the lack of inclusion costing you. And, and not just as a business, these are some business results that you might all be familiar with. The business case for DNI has been around for decades. Um, Harvard Business Review and many others have studied it, have reinforced it, provided data on it yet. And we're actually quite stagnant with the results we're seeing from those business cases being readily available. So I like to start with why does it matter to you personally, right? What's the human case? So not just the business case. Um, but a lot of times leaders will tell me, it's, yeah, I'm seeing it in turnover on my team. I'm losing good people. Maybe I'm not getting the type of good talent that I want to see that my competitors are getting. Profitability, right? 20 to 40%, depending on what source you use. Um, McKinsey and company has some great data around gender being about 21% in their latest study, layer in ethnic diversity, and it's um, just north of, I believe, 36% in their last study. So there's a big range of profitability that I think business leaders take note of, and that can really get their attention. Um, but it has to go deeper than that. Perhaps productivity. I'm not getting the, the most from my team because they're having to filter and be a different version of themselves in the workplace. Quality. There's no way if people aren't happy in the work they do that they're delivering a quality client experience. And then engagement. You know, engagement. Um, my clients that are studying engagement and putting DNI questions in their employee engagement surveys are seeing a really high correlation on those numbers leading to overall higher engagement score. And so we know <laughs> just a couple of factors that are shared here that when you don't have inclusion, you should expect at, at least a 3x higher turnover on your team, and you should be missing out on some key profitability data. So making sure we have the business case, but the human case, and that's where Chris and I are going to come from it today, 
is just acknowledging that everybody has bias. So I think a lot of bias training mentions everyone has bias and can be, we beat people over the head with the, they're the problem. They're the reason why we're not as diverse and inclusive. And not that that's not true, um, but oftentimes I cringe when I'm asked to come into organizations and talk for an hour about bias and tell everybody that they're biased and then go leave and don't be biased, right? Um, that's certainly not something when years and years of patterns and experiences and the way our brains work um, is going to undo in an hour or two hour or even a full day training session is not going to erase this bias. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, unconscious bias is a hot topic. Um, it's one that's a buzzword inside many organizations that I work with. This is the way I have it defined. So my background in unconscious bias is through the Cultural Intelligence Center is where I was certified and I practice using their values assessments. Kristen's got some other great tools that she'll talk about. Um, but the way that they've defined it, and I've kind of co-created my own definition around it, is those unintended subtle and, and again, unconscious thoughts that happen to people m most of the time, okay? So just acknowledging it happens to us a lot. Our brains are recognizing patterns, fitting them in um, to existing structures of which we've experienced and making an assumption oftentimes without us even being aware. So this is how our brain works, but it's really unhelpful when it hinders our attitudes and stereotypes we develop based on those characteristics. And generally, when people look at unconscious bias, there's way more to it than this. And we'll give you resources to explore beyond these big ones. Most people go to race, right? Because we think we can see it, not always. Age, again, it seems like a visible diversity trait, not always. Uh, ethnicity even. Uh, weight is a big one. We, we judge people based on their weight, make a lot of assumptions about them their gender, which we, again, can't always see, uh, abilities, cultural values, and appearance. So those are just some of the factors. Um, the best um, kind of free online assessment that I'm aware of that's rooted in research is through Harvard, so implicit.harvard.edu. Um, most of you are probably familiar with that one, um, but last time I checked, they had 12 different attributes, and these are just a handful of them. Um, and then this is a famous uh, slide that I think many of you have probably seen before, and but I think it's so telling to understand the systemic issues. And so when we put that up is bias is really challenging the system. The bias system is the source of inequality. So this is why bias training rarely removes the systemic barriers. So if you can kind of reframe it in this analogy here, you know, the first image, if you kind of track from left to right, the first image is assuming that everyone benefits from the same thing. Okay, so if we just provide this benefit, if we just provide this accommodation in the workplace, everyone's gonna be equal now. And obviously, there are height differences, just like there are skill differences, just like there are human differences, that that little bolster may not mean the same thing for different types of people. So in the second image, if you kind of rework that analogy, they're given different supports to make it possible for them to have equal access to the game, okay? But the fence is still there, right? So they're treated um, equitably, would be the right word to describe the second image. But in the third image, all three can see the game without supports or accommodations. So we've eliminated the supports, eliminated the accommodations, but also eliminated the systemic barrier has been addressed, it's been removed. And this is what we're talking about with bias training, to just give everybody bias training, like in the left image, is just giving them the boxes, right? Giving everybody the same thing, yeah, I'm probably not gonna have a great result. You're still gonna have different levels of inequality. And even with bias training, if I give more to leaders that we know, especially middle managers that really wrestle with this issue, um, like in this image, it's still going to be skewed because there's still the system that keeps certain people down and certain people up. Or, or we could really get to the root cause of the issue and look at why certain people don't get promoted, why pay differentials happen, systemic real barriers, not just bias training or accommodations. So this is, this is the challenge we're putting out to you. You know, what do the boxes look like in your organization? What are the supports and how are they working for the team? What image maybe are you at? And this might be a good time to chat your responses of what image do you identify of how your organization is addressing diversity and inclusion training or bias training right now. Are you giving everybody the same thing, giving everybody a little different thing, or really getting after the systemic barriers? So something to think about noodle on the chat. Um, while you're doing that, um, think about your own sources of bias. And this is where if you have more time to unpack unconscious bias and go through some of the tools that Chris and I are talking about today, 
we have to get deeper. Okay. So we have to get deeper than just that iceberg analogy where you have the iceberg on top and like it's all the stuff you can see, but it's usually all the stuff beneath that you have to tackle those root causes. Uh, this is a way bias works as well. And this really helps me understand it from my own bias point of view. So I have bias just like many, many humans do. Um, and understanding gender roles, um, especially the ones you saw in, the, in your childhood, affect how you perceive gender. So think about your parents, right? Think about uh, your school teachers. Think about uh, your mentors. Think about the people you spent time with as a child, especially in those formative years. You, you base a lot of your perceptions around what women and men and, and the gender spectrum is behaving based on the gender roles you saw as a child. So that's just baked in pattern behavior. It doesn't mean you can't undo it. Um, but oftentimes if I talk with somebody that had, say, a stay-at-home mom, and that was, you know, traditional um, many years ago, um, not, nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, and then um, perhaps a male figure that was a provider. This is just more commonplace generally. Um, they might have perceptions in the workplace of men being a provider and women being a caregiver, even if that's not true for others in the workplace. So that's an example of how that gender role as a child might show up for you in your biased behavior. Racial exposure. So how much did you have friends that were of different races, different ethnicities? How much did they come into your home? How much did you go to their home? Okay, and this is a big one for me because I was exposed a lot in, I would say, in my elementary days, but suddenly it changed in my middle school days and I, and I moved to a different part of town. Um, there were some social considerations there, but what happened, you know? Um, and that's something I really thought long and hard about with my racial bias. Uh, an LGBTQ plus friend or family we know Knowing somebody in the LGBTQ plus community increases your understanding, especially if you're exposed at a young age. So this is something I thankfully I knew my aunt growing up um, that identified um, as a lesbian. And so knowing her and her story made me so much more empathetic to, to other people that I met that also identified in the LGBTQ plus community. I travel. <laughs> we can't travel right now. We can virtually. There's still lots of opportunities for virtual travel. I've heard all sorts of museums are opening up virtually. So you still can do it. It just looks different, admittedly. Um, but we know that travel abroad, especially at a young age in college, and for me it was in grad school, spending time seeing the world different than how we treat it, whether it's in the States or in Canada, you know, it, it's just different in other places. And I actually had a big understanding of like, this is different and I really like it, right? Rather than judging it, it's why are they this way instead of this way? And curiosity, um, curiosity did not kill the cat. That adage is not good. <laughs> the more open you are to other points of view, the more you can manage your bias. Um, and then I'll take a brief break here. Um, I saw some chats come in, so I wanna make sure to capture those. Um, Loretta had most organizations I work with check the first box. It's easy. It doesn't create a pushback. Yep, it's check the box, Loretta. Perfect segue to this slide. Kathy, I believe my organization's in the second photo, working towards the third photo. That's a great place to be on, Kathy. Kudos to you. Uh, Lise had our organization's the second box leading into the fourth image where people are involved in the main activity. The fence is removed completely and individuals are sitting in the audience's seat based on different. Oh, that's so beautiful. Different positions to see the game. Um, and main activity clear. I love that analogy. So even just showing your team that image and having this conversation can be something tangible you can take back to your organization from today. Uh, that's a great point of view, says Kathy. So awesome. Well, I want to kick it over to Kristen here in a minute. Just wanted to share this last piece of content on the why. This is where I see, see kind of the infamous analogous wheels fall off the bus with bias training. So you're not alone if this is you. Um, but it's certainly never long enough. And, you know, as tr corporate trainers, I always want a whole day. I usually get a half day and sometimes just two hours. I'll take what I can get. Um, but if it doesn't feel authentic and it feels very check the boxy, like we're here to do this and give everybody those boxes and not really give people systemic tools to help address it in the moment, people are going to go back to revert back to past behavior, Right. Um, if it's one and done and it's not threaded, I love learning that's threaded consistently over time. So it has to be consistent. The fourth point, you have to have consistent touch points over time, tools, a little bit of splashes here and there. And this is something beautiful we're seeing in the virtual world. It's much more easy to apply that just-in-time learning virtually, whether that's video or things like this. Um, and in the moment, tools, when you need it, when someone says something and you want to do something and you don't know what to say, happens a lot. And without the tools, people are still going to 
go back to the past behavior, which is usually duck and hide. <laughs> and then start with discomfort. You know, like bias training is not a good place to start the diversity and inclusion conversation, especially if you haven't addressed why this is important to you as an organization. Um, so it's not going to lead in a behavior shift if, if it's inauthentic, if it's one and done, consistent, any one of these things is going to create um, a not so good behavior shift. And then it kind of justifies, see that stuff doesn't work. Things are still the same. So it's a perpetual self-fulfilling cycle. Um, so I want to kick it over um, to Kristen to share more about why bias training wasn't designed to work. Thanks, Julie. Uh, and before I kind of dive into the, to the details onto the, on this slide, I just want to just go back a little bit to say, you know, um, unconscious bias training is a thing that a lot of you and a lot of organizations have been using in one way shape or form and when uh when i say often very very loudly you know don't do unconscious bias training that does like julie said kind of like stir up a lot of emotions a lot of feelings and that's because you know a lot of folks who are putting this into play really are champions for equality and diversity and really want to see their workplaces make change and become more inclusive and more effective and more prosperous through that process um, and and by no means would I ever suggest that you know no one should tackle their bias because like like Julie said the way that we develop our unconscious biases it happens over time they can change over time it's an evolving thing and it really is a very uh, important thing to consider as individuals to go on that journey of exploring what are the things that I'm biased for and against how did I develop them and and really take on that that work it really is work to unpack that and to do what you can to try and uh, get to the root of those issues on a personal level um, but it's become a really ubiquitous thing in the workplace, probably because it's been around for, you know, upwards of actually 50 years in one way, shape or form. And, and in these slides, I'm kind of showing you where it actually was birthed. Um, in the States in particular, you had some really, really important social movements uh, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, both in the uh, women's liberation movement or women's rights movements and the civil rights movements. And that period of time saw a lot of diversity in the workforce. And with the inequalities that existed at the time, it, it really perpetuated action and activism around making sure that folks had equality of opportunity in those workforces, regardless of their dimensions of diversity. And so in, in the States and in Canada and elsewhere, we saw a lot of legislation coming out that was, was designed to, to varying degrees and at different entry points, uh, go towards encouraging those equality of opportunity uh, scenarios. But that also uh, created a litigious environment in some cases and a lot of organizations were seen scrambling to go well, what can we do what can we put into place that we can then say okay we've taken some steps we've done something to try and mitigate against this kind of you know prejudice and discrimination in our organizations and so at the time diversity trainings that started with unconscious bias training they they were not birthed by the activists they were not designed by people who necessarily were were facing inequality themselves, but it was initially designed as a risk mitigation tool. And I think uh, understanding kind of the origins can help us both remove a little bit of, of that personal attachment we have to bias training uh, when we can kind of look at it uh, from a different level, a little bit of a different perspective and see that, okay, you know, like maybe then let's take another look at what components go into the bias training, like Julie said. Um, and so it, it, it wasn't necessarily designed in the first place to go, how can we remove systemic bias? bias training wasn't designed as the solution for that. So I just wanted to put that out there. And now I, I, I said in my intro, I, I am an academic and I struggle sometimes to kind of like veer away from research, but it is also something that I find really helpful when we explain why it is uh, at, the, at the cerebral, at the brain level, why unconscious bias training doesn't necessarily work. And, and just again, to kind of lay a foundation of what it is I'm talking about when I say that, you know, the, the typical unconscious bias training session will bring folks together in a room it will you know maybe give them a, a chance to take that assessment Julie mentioned Harvard's implicit uh, association test to just become aware right we've got bias let's become aware of some of the ones that we've got and now let's talk about how we might undercut those biases 
Um, but what's really interesting, and there's a lot of research on how, how this works in the brain, is that it's not always just like the format or the sentiment around a training, but, but what our brains do with that kind of information and that kind of challenge, okay? So I'm just going to cover three here. And, and when on our digital uh, conversation space that many of you have hopped into already, you'll be able to download a couple of uh, fact sheets and research there after our session today. But one of them is, one interesting thing that happens is when an organization already has systems in place like metrics for advancement or um, criteria for determining who is going to get a promotion or not. Um, that kind of creates a sentiment that, that there's a belief in meritocracy in this place, right? And, and hardly anybody would really ever admit, if it exists, that their organization shoots from the hip when it comes to these things, right? There are systems in place. And when there are systems in place, and individuals like hiring managers or people managers look around and they go, well, we've got, we've got systems. It gives kind of a bolstering to the sense of meritocracy. And then people tend to behave in ways that they just let themselves rely on their gut because they're bolstered by what they believe is meritocratic. And again, this is not because people are bad. This is not because they are, you know, acting in a way that they know is going to uh, disadvantage some people in their organization. It's just what our brains do in that type of scenario. Uh, the other thing that happens is, is unconscious bias training in the way I described it can actually lead to people justifying bias decision making. And I use a different analogy for this. I use the one of like health and wellness. So, you know, a person uh, does some research on how it is they should move and feed their bodies and they get committed and they put some systems in place. And, you know, let's say they're taking on a fitness regime or something. And, and it looks like this on a, on a day to day basis. So I went for a run this morning. That's awesome. I'm doing really well. I ate, you know, a nice, healthy, balanced lunch, and somebody's offering me chocolate cake tonight. Well, yeah. I mean, like I've done all this great stuff, and I, I can do, I can have the chocolate cake because I did that. And that happens at varying levels of consciousness for people, but unconscious bias training has been shown to have a similar effect. That you know, folks take the training, maybe it's a once and done, maybe it's a persistent thing, but this concept that I've done this, and so now the decisions I make afterwards are going to be protected inside of like a broader system of my thinking now around bias. And again, like this is an opportunity for me to say, there's, folks are not bad. We are not acting in ways that we are actively trying to undercut the value of what a bias training might offer. It's just how our human brains act in these scenarios. And the last one I think is really, really interesting. And it's about how when we talk about dimensions of diversity in an unconscious bias training session, whether that's gender, race, ethnicity, age, a lot of the uh, items Julie touched on, that it can actually make our differences more salient, more evident to us. And we can actually act, think, and perceive things in ways that align more closely to the stereotypes we have around those. And I'm gonna give you an example again from another space outside of the corporate world, but uh, in education, for example, it's been shown that uh, when we're triggered by a stereotype, we're gonna act in that way. So there was a study done with a group of students uh, with a math test. And when they were given the math test, they were asked just to put their name and gender and then complete the math test. On another, uh, with another group, they were asked to put their name, ethnicity, gender, and complete the math test. And in the first group, where gender was the only thing identified, they, they sliced out the results and found that girls from an Asian background would perform more poorly than boys of any background. But then, on the test where they were asked to identify name, ethnicity, age, uh, gender, sorry. And so it triggered the, the Asian stereotype that those students would then actually perform better than their other female peers because what they were activating their brains was a stereotype around how it is that Asian people perform when it comes to maths and sciences. So it's a fascinating, mind-blowing study to see that when we activate our brains to be thinking around dimensions of diversity, not only will we subconsciously engage in behavior that supports those stereotypes, but we can see it in others as well. And and I mean, for me, this is, this is the sort of thing that you think, wow, behavioral design can really have a lot of promise 
when it comes to how we might uh, address these biases and, and uh, issues around inequality in the workplace. Yeah, so good, Kristen. I appreciate you sharing that study. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to hit pause. We have another poll here. So a chance, another chance to kind of get engaged at the halfway point. Um, we talked a bit about what the lack of inclusion could be costing you. So if you had to quantify it, um, there's a few choices here um, that we shared kind of in the why for better training. Is it dollars? Is it turnover? Is it maybe you're not getting as much innovation? client satisfaction, employee engagement, or the other. So we just ask if we hit other, please do chat. So we've got that launched. While we're doing that, we'll dig into the second session. So see a good healthy amount coming in here. Ah, employee engagement, oh, no, innovation, cool. Um, so just a few other things that we wanna share on the what. So if, if, to Kristen's point, if bias training somehow triggers the myth of meritocracy, or I love, you know, that I went through bias training, I'm done. I'm, 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 a, I, I'm inclusive now. I've arrived, which I always say being inclusive is a journey. It is not a destination. So bias training is by no means the end point. It's usually much more on the beginning of the journey. There's so much more work to do, um, but it, it really speaks to um, the value of continuing this conversation. So it looks like we're going to close out at about 86% voted. So cool. Thanks everybody for doing that. I employ engagement. So that's really interesting to see 77% selected that and you were able to actually select different ones here. So um, less innovation. Okay. Is second. And then we had turnover and then we had a couple others that'll look like our Chapman, all of the above. <laughs> looks like some agreement. And then Kathy's asking a question, Kristen, about the source of the study from the education example. So we'll be sure to provide that. Um, we do have the online forum that Kristen launched to give you an invitation to. So that's where we can keep the conversation going after today as well. Um, so employee engagement, and we'll, we'll be sure to save some time at the end for questions as well. So it looks like employee engagement is, um, is the front runner here. So good to, good to see you're all making that connection. And then Elise had um, leadership succession that reflects community served. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's something that really gets leaders attention. Hey, who are you serving, right? From your community base, your customer base, or who do you want to be serving? What do they look like? What do they behave like? Um, and how much are you reflecting that as a leadership team? And if you're like most of corporate America, the white men leading those organizations, that certainly can't be as, as reflective as you would like. Uh, it's hard to categorize, Bill said, because all lead to organizational exclusion. Yeah. Yeah. They were not mutually exclusive. That's why you were allowed to pick multiple ones. So I appreciate the insight there. Really good data. Um, and this helps us know um, how, how you're experiencing uh, training and, and where you see the benefits. So what, what I like to offer is the what. So the what piece now is like, okay, what? Like if, if bias training isn't work, working, if we could be better, um, what could I be doing? Um, so first and foremost, what I see organizations struggle with is a lack of focus on middle managers. So what we know to be true, roughly, and this is a rough estimate here, um, it varies industry to industry, but most are what I would call diverse-ish, or I have in quotes here, non-diverse groups of people that are middle managers. So two-thirds of managers in corporate America are, are identified as white men. Um, and I have written books about allies, I write about engaging white men in the conversations. So by no means do I think they are the problem. I think they absolutely can be part of the solution. But traditional bias training, traditional training, I mean, I have seen vocally and body language wise, people in a rooms like not here by choice. And that's a big miss. So if you're not engaging your middle managers, that is an opportunity um, because they influence the employee experience. So back to employee engagement from hiring to promoting to pay increases to separation decisions, they hold the keys, right? So most organizations got, got everyone singing from the same song sheet up top and your board's involved because they've seen that business case data and there's pressure maybe from big clients. And then you have the bottom layer front lines that you know, Gen Z and, and millennials a lot really believe in inclusion because that's the way they were raised and had a lot of ethnic diversity and gender diversity and, and lots of layers of diversity through their own experiences are more likely to see those things. So then you have this murky middle, five, 10, 15 years in, they may not have experienced diversity inclusion themselves or been a part of any initiative. So they're uncomfortable. And, and I hear these statements verbatim. You know, I don't want to open that can of worms. Why would I talk about diversity and inclusion? That's not my issue to bring up. Why would I go to the women's group? I'm a man. Why would I go to the African-American group? I'm white. 
those types of comments, um, which are not helpful, but understandably so when you've been taught that you're the enemy, you have bias, you're the one that has privilege, lots of rhetoric that kind of supports the exclusion of the middle manager. So how do we flip that script? They need tools. They need to know how to have the conversation. So honestly, time and time again, Managers will tell me, like, just give me the words to say. Tell me what to do. When someone says something or does something that's super unhelpful, what do I do? Or, hey, I want to be proactive with this conversation. Give me the TED Talks, the podcast, the discussion guides to feel this and proactively talk about this with my team. Because I want to talk about it, but I don't know how, right? They're hungry for, for tools. So I would look at these as check, check the boxes, which we don't like for bias training. But if you had to like think of criteria that would be really important for middle manager bias training and diversity training, I would have discussion guides. So people love the five questions to get fill in the blank conversation started. I have a series of those on my website. You're all um, welcome to download. People love that right? because they can ask one of those questions or if the conversation runs out, they've got a backup question. I call them um, to a back, a questions put in your back pocket. Activities, you know, and just like Kristen shared that case study, you know, things like that for people to react to, respond to, read this article, go watch this video, do this thing, and then come prepared to discuss it. Five minute videos fit into active calendars and are a really great way to start and end the day. And then in existing meetings, you can use them to discuss them. And in a virtual work environment, people should not have an excuse to watch a five minute video, right? Podcasts, um, there's recommended expert curated content that we're happy to share with you. Several, several amazing podcasts out there that do a great job. Kristen and I, Kristen was on my podcast talking about this topic. There's lots of ones you can seed the conversation. So you don't have to be the expert as a manager, but you can know the toolkit to provide to your team to facilitate the conversation. And I call it choose your own adventure. People love the narrative, I remember in the 80s reading books, Choose Your Own Adventure, and getting to finish the book how you wanted it to. This still resonates with people, especially in management. Like, don't tell me just how to do it, but give me maybe a series of choices that I can make, and then I can fill in the blanks. Make sure, though, in any training you're using, you provide psychological safety. And this is why it's really hard to do internal training as an outside trainer. I don't have my own bias about the inner workings of the team and I can provide a space around psychological safety because we create ground rules up front, kind of lead and frame that, hey, you're going to see some comfort with discomfort here, right? And, and we need to make sure that we have spaces to share things privately and publicly and honor people's um, bravery and where they want to have bravery. Um, ensure that people can complete exercises privately and that's secured and that's their choice to share. That's, that's a best practice. I call them brave spaces, not safe places. Um, just because, you know, while they're psychologically safe, it requires bravery a lot of times to bring a question up that's uncomfortable, right? The things that people are really harboring could be deeply, deeply rooted and um, in embarrassing. So how do you have a brave place where people can be vulnerable? Give people time to process. People learn at different rates. So make sure you have gaps built in for people to think, reflect, come prepared to discuss. I love giving people questions, discussion guides, and a week from now, we're going to talk about it. So they're prepared. Honor the introverts. Uh, I think it's estimated uh, from the book Quiet that around 50% of people are introverts. So I myself am an ambivert, but I love people. Um, but I also like me time. So some people like the one-on-one, -on -one, some people like the big group. Don't expect everybody to talk in a big group setting. No matter what, connection is what's truly important in psychological safety. So reinforcement, repetition, making sure that people can deeply connect with these tools. And what gets measured gets done. So have measurement. And it's just so easy to measure in a virtual learning environment with learning management systems, video participation rates. Um, we've launched our online tool that many of you have discussed. You can see who's actively participating. You can see who earns badges, those types of things. Open rates, board activity. Um, I love doing pre and post perception change assessments. Before this, I believe this. After this, I believe this. What wouldn't it be cool if we could actually measure behavior shifts like promotion data, um, hiring data, recruiting data, <laughs> interview slates, all sorts of things that show true behavior shifts and performance increases.
Um, other criteria to consider on your list is consistency. So uh, I offer a monthly touch point. That could just be a five minute video. It doesn't have to be a full day training exercise, but maybe every quarter we have a full day or half day training. Uh, online discussions, I think we've seen. It's really pressure tested the virtual learning environment that online discussion boards really do work. Um, and you want to have a blend of private sharing, again, and public sharing um, with workbooks and tools that people can print out, type into, follow along independently. Timely, real-time tools. So when I have a snag, where do I go? When I have a situation, who do I talk to? Having timely live support. And then I believe in leaders. So all layers, mostly the C-suite and the senior leadership team, it just like trickles down. Most middle managers, when I'm talking to, um, don't have a consistent program. They may have done the bias training. They may have done um, inclusive leadership training, coaching training. You know, these are all great, but no one's webbed the tools together. And assessments. So if you assess behavior, a 2x higher success rate. So Kristen, I'll turn it over to you to what should you do? Thanks, Julie. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit here about some of the um, factors or features that have um, been shown to be effective in changing behavior. Uh, so I talked a little bit before about how tricky our brains work when it comes to trying to become aware of bias and then act in less biased ways and, and how that, you know, has got a whole lot of pitfalls to it. But there is equally a lot of really exciting research that talks about some of the ways that we can design trainings or workshops or supports to uh, have the best possible outcomes. And so I'm going to list a couple of them here. These will also be available to you in a longer white paper format in our online conversation space. If, that, if that's something that you've missed, by the way, I'll make a note in the comments shortly about where you can find the invitation to that space in your email. Um, but these are some of the features. Um, the first one, uh, and this isn't in a numbered format, but one of them is to engage natural champions to lead the change. Uh, a lot of time, unconscious bias training or diversity training sessions are made mandatory. And that's and often from a good place of intention to say, listen, this really matters to our organization. And so this is going to become a thing that, you know, either all hiring managers take or everyone in a certain department takes. Um, but it's been shown that as soon as, you know, folks who aren't already champions for the change and already caring about, about equality, diversity, and inclusion, it automatically gets their backs up and can, can put a sour taste in people mouths and I'm sure a lot of you have seen that uh, and so one thing that you can do is is make initially trainings uh, voluntary so that they can come they can have a good experience they can then talk about it among their peers in a way that seems positive and inviting and makes other folks more likely to engage in that sort of training moving forward so that's one way you can do it uh, another one is to really focus on the organizational or behavioral design possibilities. So in the image that Julie showed before of removing that systemic barrier, when we are able to talk to our people about how much promise there is in actually looking around us in our organizations to the systems and processes we have in place, and that the bias that is there is something we can all tackle together. Uh, that it's not, you know, we're not turning and pointing the finger at individuals to say, now you need to be the change. You need to tackle your personal and conscious bias to the benefit of our business and to the benefit of our people, but that actually together, collaboratively, we can look at how it is that we run things in this place. What are the constraints around how we behave and make choices and promote people and hire people and so on? How can we look at that together collaboratively, collectively, bring to it our shared lived experiences to identify where those um, processes might have opportunities to create greater inclusion, greater equity? Um, Perspective taking is another one. Julie talked about how our exposure over the course of our lives to different sorts of people and different lived experiences can really help grow our empathy. And so can perspective taking. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of uh, trends in, in the diversity inclusion space around um, augmented reality, virtual reality, where people can kind of, for a moment, step into the shoes of someone who lives a different life from them. And of course, there's limitations to this, like there are for everything, but any time we have the opportunity to hear about the experiences that others face in, in, our, in our 
world and our workplace. It, it expands our possibility for empathy. Uh, this is actually something that's happened a lot recently as folks are experiencing coronavirus in very different ways. We've got some, I've had, I've had some people say to me, Kristen, like this is the best thing to happen to me. I'm not getting waylaid in the hallways and at the lunchroom with, with ad hoc responsibilities and chats. And I am now having time for myself. Um, and I'm taking time to develop, you know, self-care and take on hobbies that I didn't before. But then in another camp, you've got people who are just simply like burning the candle at both ends. They're trying to manage kids and schoolwork and, and work. The experiences are so different, but when we talk about those uh, candidly, we can begin to understand how other folks experience things in different ways than we do. So practicing perspective taking in the course of a training session can be really powerful. Um, another one is to encourage goal setting. Julie mentioned this earlier as well, is that when folks are, are given a training, it really does bring them practical, tactical solutions, and then they can look into their near term or medium term and identify opportunities to implement those learnings and share those with others. The accountability there is valuable, but it also gives them a sense of accomplishment like any of us do when we set goals that are attainable, that are, that are timely and immediate, that we can say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to practice this new uh, way of thinking, or I'm going to practice this new way of questioning, and I'm going to do it at my all hands meeting next Monday, you know, and that's my goal. It's small, it's, it's achievable, and I'm going to do it then. Now, the other two things that I haven't quite touched on yet are just practicing more equitable decisions over time and taking a problem solving approach. Again, when we talk about addressing people's unconscious bias and as more folks begin to realize exactly how entrenched those are and how difficult they are to uproot and change, that can feel really deflating. It can feel really impossible for some people. And so when we're able to think about, again, those systemic biases, the systemic barriers to equality of opportunity and inclusion, that gives us something to focus on that in many ways is much more tangible than our unconscious biases. And when we take the approach collectively that, you know what, we're going to admit we probably have some inequities in our promotion practice or in our hiring practice or in how it is that we do uh, you know, succession planning. Let's look at that together and let's look at that as a challenge that we can overcome collectively together if we look at it with all of our shared experiences and with a lens for how it is that it can be made more equitable. That really has uh, the effect of firing people up because they see that they can be part of the solution in a really tangible way. Um, yeah, so that's that, that's that. <laughs> Good stuff, Kristen. Well, we're going to wrap up here with some how points. Um, we should have plenty of time for Q&A, so get, get ready with your questions and thoughts. Um, I had one question pop in on the chat while Kristen was talking. Robin had, why aren't companies holding middle managers accountable for their inclusion <laughs> metrics like other metrics? So I hear excuses for this one. <laughs> um, I, I agree with you. Um, it's an obvious question. And if you're truly committed to diversity and inclusion, you would hold managers accountable like on their performance reviews. However, um, a lot of times organizations will tell me there's so much buying for their time. The middle managers pinned right between the leadership team and the front lines. And I myself spent a lot of time here in corporate America. So I have tons of empathy for conflicting priorities or sandwiched in between. So to layer on another metric, another goal, and ex other expectation, I think sometimes we think is asking too much, which is obviously a mistake, but we're not linking that business case of if they do this, those behaviors will drive results. So organizations that take more a behavior leads to results approach, a mindset over achievement, results focus, um, tend to have more sustainable, <clears throat> excuse me, long-term benefits. And we're going to see this in the post-coronavirus world, right? The organizations that were already doing these things, I'm going to put my bet on them to weather the storm. But those that had a short-term mindset are really going to struggle with some of this. So it's, it's really a mindset of the organization to commit to the long-term and hold managers accountable. Um, a couple ideas that I have. So if I were to put together... Um, my ideal inclusive leadership program, which I do have available virtually, and I have a number of clients that have subscribed to this. These are the nine things that I think are really important from taking everyone from like base level awareness 
all the way to practicing some tough stuff like vulnerability, empathy, candid conversations, this topic of unconscious bias, but then digging deeper on gender, race, LGBTQ, and disabilities, because each one of those from a bias perspective show up differently. And I do think that's one thing I would add to the conversation we haven't gotten the chance to talk about is looking at the different dimensions of diversity. And these are just a handful, right? They're kind of the big five. Um, there's so much more to the dimensions of diversity and really getting people to understand how they themselves may not see themselves as diverse. But they have their own diversity story, really guiding people through that. So I just want to offer up, um, <clears throat> I'm offering a special discount um, just because times are tough right now. Um, it's an individual learning program, but you can also get group access to that. So I'll send the link, check it out. Um, it's a, my, my clients that are doing this actually have badges to certify that I'm an ally. I'm striving to be an ally because it's an eye of the beholder. Um, but then they have little badges for each completion that you have with empathy and race and disability. So I'm just so excited to see how it unfolds. Um, my new book, this is a super easy way to carry forth the conversation um, with your leadership team, especially with the middle manager. So I wrote this with my own corporate America experience and all the treasure trove of the stories I've heard from corporate America. These six things with the culture, stretching talent equally, ally networks, meeting behavior, so telling of the culture, um, belonging, and then measuring success excuse me. Um, and it's available on Amazon. Um, Audible price is the last day at just $1.99 and, um, or a Kindle rather, um, but the Audible is available as well for $5.99 and paperback. So every review helps and it's a great guide that you can circulate with your team and have a book discussion. I have a complimentary book discussion guide you can ask me about too. Kristen, tell them about some of your ideas. Sounds good. And, um, I'll touch on Robin's comment as well and, and saw some coming in from Kathy and Navita. Um, I think that, you know, like Julie said, when it comes to incentivizing managers around diversity, metrics can be a really powerful driver. Uh, the one thing I would add to that is just a really good kind of supervision of that when it does happen. We saw in kind of in Uber in pre-2017 that came out as a really public example about how attaching metrics to diversity actually saw managers create really toxic environments where they were they were preventing the lateral movement of team members to maintain their diversity numbers inside their teams and so um, that's just to say that you know again like like so many diversity and inclusion interventions the theory the sentiment the intention is absolutely right and and it really you know you just really need to keep an eye on how it is that then that's actioned and and put into place so accountability around just watching how that lays out is really important and uh kathy you mentioned what about pay and performance equity and uh and, and, and this is kind of a good segue into what it is that my team has recently put online. Uh, we, we developed a, kind of our, our answer to unconscious bias training several, uh, just last year actually, that we put into play, and it's called the equity sequence. And the equity sequence uh, is a training. It is a series of five equity focused questions that can be practiced by individuals or teams in just about any setting or situation. Uh, they can be applied to product design, process uh, improvement, uh, any sort of uh, communications design. I've got a list there on that slide. And essentially you can learn these five questions and you apply it. You can apply it in under 20 minutes when you know how to do it. And it really helps you begin to identify those opportunity points to either re reduce bias that exists in a process or create new opportunities for increased equity. And so, for example, when Kathy mentioned pay and performance equity, you know, there are people that you can be bringing to that conversation conversation around pay and performance equity in your organization and begin to really dig into the processes, what they look like, and bring a new perspective to those to maybe reveal some opportunities to create greater equity where you might not have known they exist already. And so we, as with the turn of COVID, you know, Julie mentioned she used to be doing, you know, speaking on the stage, we used to be training teams in-house on uh, the equity sequence all over Canada and the States. And so we have done a pivot there and uh, created a light touch training online that is available um, either through our website with, and we're giving this um, discount code as well for 25% off the enrollment. It's already a, a low cost training as is, but we've had our first cohort go through and, and be certified in the equity sequence there. Uh, and it's just a really very practical, applicable 
workable process that any person, regardless of rank or role in your organization, can train in and become a, and, and start applying really quite immediately to the types of things that they're engaged in, the work that they're doing in their organization. So that's that's my most exciting thing for me to share today. That's awesome. Um, Nabetha had another question uh, or a comment rather. We have seen that even when there is a metric and the performance evaluation for middle managers and above, the value assigned to it is so low it's not taken seriously. Yeah, that's a big signal. Um, it really comes down to them being able to understand the business case and the human case. Yeah, I, I think there's a real caution like Kristen shared in having a, a number metric. I'm thinking about it more from a competency perspective and a behavior perspective, much like our training programs are designed. Like how much are they practicing empathy, emotional intelligence, can of conversations, interventions, like all of these things that honestly, they need to be taught and no one gives anybody the toolkit um, in, in any corporate training that I certainly experienced or in, in, in my own higher education um, to know how to do these things. And so people do need access to these tools and then accountability on the behaviors, not necessarily the quotas. So um, that tends to drive positive behavior that leads to better results versus just measuring the results. And sometimes people have negative behaviors that lead to those results. Um, so we'll give you both the coupon codes um, for Kristen's online program and my online program. So I'm offering 10% off as well. Um, it's nine hours of content that you'll get access to um, in my program. And Kristen has a great bite-sized module that she's taken her live program and scaled back um, to be on a virtual setting, which I think now more than ever, people have time. I'm hearing people are hungry for professional development and personal development. So I think it's, it, it's um, you know, a lot of my clients are saying, no, hold pause. We're in crisis mode. Yes, maybe now, but I'd encourage you as we get closer to the summer months, people really do want to continue to sharpen the saw, get engaged in this work and participate, and they need tools to get there. So please know the tools we're offering is um, with great intention to help you be better. So we'd love to continue the conversation. Um, Kristen's going to make sure everybody has access to that online space so that you can access the house space account. Um, so she put a chat out there um, with the note and to make sure you got your email. It didn't go to the spam folder. So good thoughts there. So um, that is all the content we had for you today. Who has questions, other thoughts? Um, and we'll wrap up with some commitment settings. So I'd love um, questions, thoughts, and if we could wrap up with something positive, an idea. We gave you a smattering of ideas. <laughs> um, hopefully no shortage of ideas, but I do know one thing. When I have a lot of ideas, I got to pick one <laughs> to prioritize. Otherwise, I don't do any of them. So if you're like me and love to have ideas and my whiteboard's full of ideas, um, picking one can help. Uh, so Elise has a question, where do we retrieve the recording of this slides? At least I will send that to everybody's um, email, that uh, the email that you registered with. Um, we'll put that on YouTube. It'll be private access just for you for the next 30 days. Um, you can share it though um, with a, kind of your close network. So feel free to do so. Many thanks, Elise. Thanks for participating and thanks for investing. I know we just asked for a small investment. Um, Kristen has some great tools that she's sharing in the online space. So if you haven't checked that out, um, that is 100% of your investment has gone towards that. So just know that we really want to be helpful and continue the conversation. So you have both of our email addresses. Um, reach out to us, schedule some time with us. We can walk you through our online content too. Um, Loretta's got a commitment, integration of the human case into the conversation. And that's a really cool one. You know, people will share like, it's the right thing to do for humans or, you know, Kristen, you probably hear all sorts of things too. I love it when somebody connects with like their own personal story and experience. That's the most compelling. Um, men often will tell me like they were raised by strong women or they have a daughter. And while this isn't, um, you're not an expert <laughs> by that, having that in your life. It is a great bridge to a much deeper conversation, especially on allyship. Cool. Thanks, Loretta. I appreciate that. Who else has some commitments or questions? Tara, adding pre and post perception changes suite of training. And that's super easy to do, Tara. Um, I have a 20 question assessment I ask people pre and post. So, and it, it's really nice because five point scale, it adds up to 100. So, it's really easy for me to do the math. Uh, great hour. Great to be with you too, Kathy. Um, but those are super easy to add. Thanks for the great session, Robin. Other thoughts, other questions? Kristen, do you want to share any kind of closing thoughts as we wrap up? 
just to just to encourage folks that there you know there are new ways to begin uh, tackling inequities in our organizations and not to be discouraged if what you have been doing so far doesn't seem to have been working because actually you know I see behind every challenge a real opportunity to try something new and so uh, Julie and I are both here to support you we both really care about creating a world where quality is the new status quo so don't hesitate to reach out if we yeah. can support I forgot I had one more poll for those of her still with us. Um, what did you learn today? So if you don't want to jump on the chat, a uh, little hesitant in there, you can vote. It looks like most people are voting. So new ideas, how to talk about this. Um, we talked about allyship and, and getting that middle manager involved. So maybe that's a part of the conversation. Thanks, everybody. Cool. And if you picked other, do chat at us. Love to hear perceptions. So it's been a great hour of my life. I know it flew by. Uh, I miss being with people so much. <laughs> these Every time I'm on these things, I don't know about you, but I'm like, I miss trading. I miss speaking so much. Um, so I'm so thankful that you spent the time with us, that you're passionate about this, you're engaged in this, you're doing good work. It really does matter. Um, compassion fatigue can be a real thing with DNI leaders. I feel it too. The weight of the world is on us a lot, um, but everything you're doing, being here today, making the space and practicing these tools, it does make a difference in people's lives. And it's really cool when you get to think about the work that we get to do. Um, not everybody gets to say that. So thank you. So it looks like um, new ideas to take action on was the clear winner here. So good. Yes, Loretta, Zoom's not the same. <laughs> For anyone getting Zoom fatigue, you're not alone. Well, Kristen, I enjoyed being with you. We'll get the recording out to you with those links and those promo codes uh, this afternoon. And do continue to engage on the online community. We'd love to hear your thoughts and continue the discussion there. So thanks, Kristen, for being with me today. Thanks, Thank everybody. you, Julie. Thanks, everyone. Bye, y'all. Have a good one.